Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the theory that fentanyl can cause clinical toxicity from passive exposure? This is also known as fentanyl panic. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of fentanyl panic, then offer my analysis. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is used to treat severe pain and chronic pain. It is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Unfortunately, people sometimes illegally obtain fentanyl and misuse it, which has resulted in a number of negative consequences like toxicity. An overdose of fentanyl can result in slow breathing or the discontinuation of breathing. This leads to hypoxia, which is when a decreased amount of oxygen reaches the brain. This, of course, is not compatible with remaining alive. Synthetic opioids are the most common drugs involved in overdose fatalities in the United States. In 2017, 59% of opioid-related deaths involved fentanyl. On the street, fentanyl is referred to by a number of names, including Chinatown, Goodfellas, He-Man, Dance Fever, Poison, and Tango and Cash. It is often mixed with other drugs like heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. This is primarily done because of economics. Fentanyl is so potent, it takes very little to get a powerful effect. Therefore, it is more cost-effective. For a number of reasons, including the dangerousness of fentanyl, many people, including law enforcement officers, believe that the drug has almost magical properties. Specifically, they believe that a fatal overdose can result from briefly making contact with fentanyl, like on one's skin, or from being near the drug and breathing normally. There have been hundreds of dramatic stories reported in the media about casual contact with fentanyl leading to life-threatening situations. I will briefly review six of these stories. Story number one, in 2013, police officers entered a facility in Canada that was being used illegally to manufacture drugs. Some of the officers handled fentanyl, which was in the building. One officer was taken to the hospital with heart problems, and three other officers developed rashes on their arms. Story number two, in 2017, there was a report from East Liverpool, Ohio, that involved a police officer who brushed off a white powder from his uniform. Within an hour, he supposedly lost consciousness, which he regained after being given naloxone. This is also known as Narcan. It is a drug used to treat opioid overdose. A police chief in the area ordered his officers to discontinue field testing of fentanyl and other opioids. Story number three. In 2021, a sheriff in North Carolina told the public that two of his officers were involved in a drug bust. When the officers returned to the police station, they had chest pain and dizziness. One officer was rendered unconscious. They were revived with very high doses of Narcan before being transported to a hospital. The sheriff indicated that five people arrested in the drug bust could face additional charges due to what happened to the officers. Story number four, another case in 2021 involved a deputy in San Diego. The deputy bent down to grab an evidence bag and his face came within six inches of the area where he had previously tested some pills. When he stood up, he felt lightheaded and fell down. Another officer supposedly saved his life using Narcan. Story number five, in 2022, the Kansas City Police Department claimed that an officer almost died from a fentanyl overdose after examining crumpled pills in an envelope that were discovered on a suspect. He was supposedly revived using five doses of Narcan before being transported to the hospital. This takes me to the last story, number six. In July of 2022, a woman claimed that she may have been exposed to fentanyl in a McDonald's restaurant in Nashville, Tennessee. She was standing in the restaurant waiting to use the bathroom when she noticed a $1 bill on the ground. She picked it up and placed it in her pocket. After leaving the restaurant, 
She placed it in the interior of her vehicle. All of a sudden, her body went numb, she could barely talk, and she could barely breathe. Her husband was driving the vehicle. He said that in an effort to get his wife to the hospital, he drove almost 100 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone and ran every red light. Her husband also said that he developed a rash on his arm from where his wife touched him. The police in Nashville said that there were no traces of fentanyl on the $1 bill. It would appear as though the husband's driving was the only actual danger to anyone in that story. Now moving to my analysis. What is going on in these situations? Why are there so many reports of passive contact with fentanyl leading to overdose? Can passive contact with the drug actually lead to clinical toxicity? Research indicates that it is extremely unlikely that clinical toxicity from fentanyl could result through casual contact with the skin. It is also unlikely that simply being in proximity to fentanyl could cause an overdose through breathing the air. It would be very unusual for the drug to be in the air at a concentration that could cause an overdose. A research study published in 2020 examined 214 reports of alleged fentanyl overdoses by law enforcement officers. They did not find a single report that contained a plausible route of exposure. Outside of the scientific research, there are a number of reasons that the passive contact fentanyl overdose stories don't make any sense. There was an accident one time involving a lab technician who spilled liquid fentanyl over a large portion of their skin. The individual washed off the fentanyl and was fine. Emergency physicians, anesthesiologists, surgeons, pharmacists, nurses, and other people working in hospitals routinely administered fentanyl without being poisoned by it. People who illegally use fentanyl handle the drug all the time. Substance users and substance dealers are not known for adhering to strict safety protocols yet they do not get poisoned by the drug through passive contact. They do, of course, consume the drug, which can lead to overdose, but that's a much different activity. Another suspicious characteristic of these reports is how quickly the fentanyl allegedly passes through the skin and causes the symptoms. Even fentanyl patches, which are designed to deliver the drug through the skin, take between 12 and 16 hours before causing a significant blood concentration. Yet these police officers are having a nearly instantaneous reaction to fentanyl after barely touching their skin for a moment. When weighing the evidence, there is simply no reason to believe that any of these stories about fentanyl contact are true. If having fentanyl on one's skin was really as dangerous as the police are saying, many more people would be reporting clinical toxicity. In addition, it would be used by the military. There would be fentanyl grenades, fentanyl bombs, fentanyl bullets, everything the military uses as far as weapons would be covered in fentanyl. I also find it interesting that no deaths have been reported. The stories frequently involve other officers jumping in with Narcan and saving the life of the officer who supposedly overdosed. The officers in these stories use incredibly high doses of Narcan, much higher than would be required to reverse a fentanyl overdose. They would administer one dose, nothing would happen, They would administer a second dose, again nothing would happen, and they would just keep going. Maybe nothing was happening because there was nothing to reverse. Narcan won't help someone who's not overdosing. This brings me to the next question. If the stories do not involve overdoses, then what is happening? The symptoms of opioid overdose include slow heart rate, low blood pressure, slow or stopped breathing, extreme sleepiness, bluish tint to the lips, dizziness, weak muscles, pinpoint pupils, and confusion. Many of the symptoms the police officers and others have described don't seem to match those symptoms. Rather, they report symptoms like chest pain, fainting, increased heart rate, intense fear, and rashes on their skin. If we look at the symptoms of a panic attack, we see quite a bit of overlap. The symptoms of panic include racing heart, chills, sweating, feeling faint, chest pains, the feeling of losing control, tingling or numbness, shortness of breath, and overwhelming fear. Panic attacks typically do not involve rashes. 
but police officers often use latex gloves and other protective equipment. One theory is that the rashes are caused by irritation from the equipment. I think the best explanation for the passive contact fentanyl stories is panic. Police officers are understandably frightened about threats. They are trained to be sensitive to danger. Many officers look at substance users as bad or evil, as opposed to people who simply have a mental disorder. The officers believe that the substance users are out to cause them harm. Because the police view their jobs as dangerous, even relatively safe parts of the job may be incorrectly viewed as hazardous, like field testing drugs. Panic explains the occasional incident, but why have so many incidents been reported? It makes sense that a few officers are going to panic every now and then, but this phenomenon of fentanyl panic is widespread. I think what could be happening here is mass hysteria. This is also known as mass psychogenic illness. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy that occurs when people become frightened. They worry about some type of danger, then they start to develop symptoms due to that worry. This makes them feel more afraid, which leads to the symptoms getting worse. These police officers are going around in constant fear of fentanyl because they've heard of these stories. Whenever they get anywhere near fentanyl, and sometimes even when they don't, they develop symptoms of panic and falsely attribute the symptoms to fentanyl. Each time this happens, it reinforces the belief across every police officer who hears the story. It's kind of like Havana Syndrome. This is a collection of unexplained symptoms from people who worked for the U.S. State Department in Cuba. As the story of these symptoms was repeated, reports came from various places all over the world. Suddenly, other employees had these mysterious symptoms, for which there was no rational explanation outside of mental health. Now, some people look at fentanyl panic and think, okay, what's the big deal? No one is actually dying. So why not let the officers continue to believe in the myth? Maybe it will actually ensure their safety as they will have a healthy respect for the drug. Again, fentanyl is actually dangerous. It's not necessarily dangerous in the way that some police officers believe it is. But again, if they have respect for it, that could be a good thing. The problem is that fentanyl panic comes with consequences outside of having feelings of panic. It can lead to a delayed response from first responders, like they may be more reluctant to jump in and help someone who is believed to possess fentanyl. It could lead to unreasonably punitive actions against substance users. Substance users could be charged with whatever happened to the officers, even though, again, that was panic unrelated to the behavior of the substance user. Fentanyl panic also wastes resources. There are officers going to the hospital and receiving treatment for something they don't have. How can fentanyl panic be defeated? Here are a few ideas. Idea number one, the media needs to stop reporting on these tales of fentanyl panic without having experts like a pharmacist or a chemist interviewed as part of the story. Item number two, officers need to be educated about the symptoms of panic and the symptoms of fentanyl overdose. Item number three, all these false reports need to be exposed. Fentanyl panic will not stop until officers accept that it was in fact panic that caused the symptoms. There is no shame in what happened to the officers. Panic is incredibly powerful, and when it's aided by a lack of knowledge, it becomes almost unstoppable. Panic can easily travel a long distance and can defeat any physical defense. It is a devastating adversary. Now moving to my last thought. A version of fentanyl panic is emerging that has to do with picking up money on the ground. I talked about that in story number six. In addition to everything else I talked about with the nature of fentanyl, I want to make one last point about this fear of picking up money. People who illegally use substances are known for liking two things, substances and money, which can be used to buy substances. Why would they put drugs in crumpled up or folded dollar bills and leave the cash on the ground. That's a good way to lose both the drugs and the money. I think this trend just further demonizes substance users because it suggests they are intentionally poisoning people. It would seem that fentanyl panic is a not-too-distant cousin of moral panic. 
Those are my thoughts on fentanyl panic. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.